Income tax 2023-2024, maker's depreciation, which convention applies? Get ready and some coffee because we're providing some inspiration about income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So... Yeah, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in Publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023 which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula. Noting the schedule C itself, basically an income statement. Business income minus business expenses resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls in from Schedule C to Line 1 income of the formula. The formula outlined in the calculation and the Form 1040, page 1 of which we see here, Schedule C rolling into Line number 8, ultimately, additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1. Additional income adjustments to income part one. The Schedule C rolls into line three. Business income from the Schedule C. This is a Schedule C. Profit or loss from business. Having an income statement format. Income minus expenses. Expenses being our point of priority at this point in time. Noting it's usually the largest category of items within it. Some expenses being more difficult than others, like depreciation, where, as we saw in a prior presentation, even if using a cash-based system, we have to do an accrual-type thing sometimes because the tax code tells us to, such as when we buy depreciable property, putting it on the books as an asset as opposed to simply expensing it. There's no balance sheet on the tax return, therefore using other schedules, depreciation schedules, to report the balance sheet accounts of the depreciable assets and the related accumulated depreciation also calculating then the current period's expenses now being expensed not as just equipment expense but as depreciation expense remembering that this concept is borrowed by the tax code from generally accepted accounting principles and then the tax code alters it for all various reasons. Therefore, the part that we're looking at here is the maker's depreciation, the one most closely related to conceptually generally accepted or accrual accounting principles, and therefore the part that's probably most solid in the tax code. The 179 and special deductions we talked about before are kind of layered on top and those are the things that you would expect to change most greatly from year to year because they're weird. All right, so we're going to the maker's depreciation, which convention applies. So under maker's uh, averaging conventions establish when the recovery period begins and ends. So let's just get this terminology straight here. So we've got the depreciation. The question is, do we have to expense something or put it on the books as an asset? If we put it on the books as an asset, then we're going to depreciate. We've talked about the basis of depreciation, which I've been comparing lately to the, to the potential energy that we're going to consume in the form of depreciation. And we, like greedy consumers of electricity, would like to get it sooner rather than later, in part because of the time value of money. 
So, so then we would like to expense it up front, possibly using like a 179 deduction or special depreciation, or we can depreciate it. And if we don't get those, then we depreciate it over the useful life of the property, which we talked about in prior periods. So when we talk about how long we're going to depreciate over, we're talking about the class of the property and the recovery period. Is it going to be recovered in five years, three years, and so on? The next question that comes up is, well, if I actually put this on the books, do I have to depreciate the year that I put it on the books very precisely, like the hour that I purchased it, meaning the fraction of the year in hours or the fraction of the year in days or the fraction of the year in uh, months? In other words, if I purchased something in March, do I, how do I calculate that first year of depreciation? Because I didn't have it the entire year. Well, uh, the easiest thing to do is to use some kind of convention, such as, well, we'll just assume you bought it at the beginning of the year or the middle of the year or the middle of the month or the middle of the quarter. Those are going to be the conventions typically used. Much of makers for most small pieces of equipment are assumed to be like mid-year convention, although, of course, there will be exceptions. All right, so the convention you used determines the number of months for which you can claim depreciation in the year you place property in service and in the year you dispose of the property. So if you say something's going to de be depreciated over three years, you would expect then after three years the thing to be fully depreciated. In other words, if I had a depreciable assets for $100,000, I have potential energy, potential depreciation of 100000 after three years, if that's the recovery period, I would expect that cost to be have fully been utilized. I got benefits from the depreciation over three years. Therefore, the book value, the basis at the end of that time is now zero. But when I start the depreciation, I didn't have a full year. So the, then the question is, I should have a partial year of depreciation in year one and a partial year of depreciation in the last year of uh, depreciation. And what should that partial year calculation look like? All right, so first we have the mid-month convention. Use this convention for non-residential real property, residential rental property, and any railroad grading or tunnel bore. So if I purchased something, usually for small businesses, we're talking like machinery and equipment, which oftentimes you're thinking a mid-year convention. If we go to the real estate situation, it would make sense. It makes sense logically in my mind to say, well, real estate is going to be quite expensive. Depreciation is going to be very important in a large dollar amount. And therefore, it might work to be more precise, might be better. So in other words, we're not going to use a mid-year convention. I'm not going to assume then that if I bought it in February that I actually bought it in the middle of the year, but rather a mid-month convention. So if I bought it on February 1st, then I'm going to assume I bought it in the middle of February, right? Mid-February, mid-month convention. That's going to make the calculation a little bit easier than if we had to break out the fraction of the year by like days, for example. So under this convention, you treat all property placed in service or disposed of during a month as placed in service or disposed of at the midpoint of the month. So now we could just say all the months are different, of course, different number of days in each of the months. But if we can just say, like the physicists used to say, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you figure out how big a chicken coop you, you're going to have? Well, you assume all the chickens are circular in nature and whatnot, right? We make all these assumptions. Well, obviously with the tax code, we assume all the months are the same. Then we have just 12 of them. And then we could just assume that it's in the middle of the month. And that makes the calculation a lot easier. So this means that a one month, so a one half month of depreciation is allowed for the month the property is placed in service or disposed of. So your use of the mid month conventions is indicated by the MM already shown under column E in part three of form 4562. So these little terms are, are useful because if you look at the depreciation schedules and the form 4562, you'll see these terms MM and people might ask you questions. Obviously, your job as a tax preparer is to do the taxes with the help of the software, but then also to be able to kind of explain it. So someone's going to inevitably ask, what does it mean if there's an MM? 
Well, that means there's a mid-month convention. That means that the depreciation is assuming that we bought the thing in the middle of the month when it does the calculation. So the mid-quarter convention. Use this convention if the mid-month convention does not apply and the total depreciable basis of maker's depreciation you placed in service during uh, the last three months of the TAC year, excluding non-residential rental property, residential rental property, any railroad grading or tunnel bore property placed in service and disposed of in the same year and property that is being depreciated under a method other than makers are more than 40% of the total depreciable basis of all makers depreci uh, property you placed in service during the entire year. Now that was a lot of a lot to say right there. So what's what's going to be the general idea here? Well, normally if you're not talking about real estate, you're talking about other makers property like machinery and equipment property that typically has a one uh, one I'm sorry a three, five and seven year property, which is quite common for small businesses. Then then you usually are going to use a half year convention. That's going to be the default. And the half year, and so the reason we're doing mid-month is because they kind of went from, uh, I'm sorry, mid-quarter. They went from mid-month to mid-quarter, and then we're going to go to half year. But when you're actually thinking about the depreciation in practice, the default most of the time for equipment is going to be a half year convention. We assume that there's going to be half of the year or it's purchased in the middle of the year, unless the tax code feels that you're abusing the half year convention and then they, they're gonna make you do the mid-quarter convention. What does that mean? Well, for example, if I'm gonna get half a year of depreciation, no matter when I buy the property, because of a half-year convention, you might try to abuse the tax code by say, buy everything in December. If I bought everything and placed it in service on December 31st, then I can assume that I purchased it in the middle of the year, and I would get six months of depreciation that I didn't actually have the property, right? So that could be a little bit conceived as a little bit abusive because now, now I'm depreciating a bunch of stuff that I didn't actually use in the current time period. So then you've got this calculation of, well, if you purchased a lot of your stuff during the end of the year, then we're gonna force you to not use the mid-year convention, but the mid-quarter convention because we feel like you abused the mid-year convention by buying everything at the end of the year. Obviously, again, software is useful to help us to, to determine whether that threshold has been hit. But when we're doing planning in terms of how much property we should purchase and what will be the tax implications of them, we have to take into consideration the convention of mid-year versus mid-quarter and when it is that we buy the stuff. So under this convention, you treat all property placed in service or disposed of during any quarter of the of the tax year as placed in service or disposed of at the midpoint of the quarter. So obviously there's four quarters in the year, there's 12 months divided by uh, uh, <laughs> but divided by four. So you got the you know the three month quarters and so on. So uh, so then so then we would assume whatever quarter it was purchased that we purchased it in the middle of the quarter rather than the middle of the month. If you use this convention, enter MQ under column E in part three of form 4562. So when we were indicating the mid-month convention, we used an MM. When we're indicating the mid-quarter convention, we use an MQ. Caution, for purposes of determining whether the mid-quarter convention applies, the depreciable basis of property you placed in service during the tax year reflects the reduction in basis for amounts expensed under section 179 and the part of the basis of property attributable to personal use. So in other words, when we purchase like equipment, for example, our thought process would be usually that's going to default to a mid-year convention, which we'll talk more about shortly, unless I purchase a lot of the property at the end of the year, in which case the IRS is going to force me from the more favorable mid-year convention to the less favorable mid-quarter convention. It's less favorable because I get less of the depreciation in the first year, and I would like to depreciate more sooner. So that makes sense, but then it gets a little bit more complicated when you tack on the added complexities of like a 179 deduction, the special depreciation, 
as well as having property that could be both for business use and personal use. So you get the concept of it, the concept of it being, well, the IRS thinks that I'm abusing the mid-year convention by purchasing a bunch of stuff at the end of the year. Therefore, they're going to make me default over to or go from the default of mid-year to mid-quarter. But the actual calculation gets a little bit more complex given the fact that we have these other depreciation complexities like the 179 deduction, the special depreciation, and possible property that has a business and personal use. Software helps us to do those calculations, of course. However, it does not reflect any deduction in basis uh, for any special depreciation allowance. All right, then we have the half-year convention. Now, although we said it last, the half-year convention is usually basically the default that we think is going to happen for most small businesses buying equipment or something like that three-year property seven-year property uh, five-year property this is usually the default and then we'd have to go from that default to possibly a mid-quarter and then if we bought large property like real estate that's when you're usually thinking mid-year so my thought process on this is usually the the mid-month is the default for most things that are purchased unless I purchase real estate, which it makes sense to go to the mid-month convention because of the dollar amount of the real estate is, is really high typically. And then the mid-quarter convention only kicks in generally if uh, we purchase a lot of the stuff that would have been in a mid-year or half-year convention at the end of the year, because then the IRS is gonna force us to go from the half-year or mid-year to the uh, mid-quarter. Okay. So use this convention if neither the mid-quarter convention nor the mid-month convention applies. Under this convention, you treat all property placed in service or disposed of during a tax year as placed in service or disposed of at the midpoint of the year. So you can see the way they kind of gave it in the code here. They, they put the most common one last because this is kind of the catch-all category. So in but in practice, obviously, that's the one you think of first, typically, because it is the catch-all category, and they're defining the other two categories as the things that, that, that where this doesn't apply, right? And this is basically kind of everything else is why I think they ordered it in their publication the way they ordered it, starting with mid-month, then mid-quarter, then half-year, whereas I would think logically you would start, and in your mind you're probably thinking half-year first, then mid-quarter, and then you know mid-month probably. But in any case, under this convention, you treat all property placed in service or disposed of during a tax year as placed in service or disposed of at the midpoint of the year. So obviously now, if I purchased it in February, I'm going to assume I purchased it in the middle of the year. So this means that, the tw that for a 12-month tax year, a one-half year of the depreciation is allowed for the year the property is placed in service. Now, just be aware that this uh, causes confusion sometimes because uh, we're usually using a double declining balance, that's what makers usually uses, and a half-year convention, which actually comes out to the same result oftentimes if you were to use a straight-line method for an entire years of depreciation in the first year. So that leads people to get confused about whether or not we're using a double declining balance or a or a straight line. But it's not the same, right? It's not the same thing. So you'll, in other words, you could come up with the same answer if you used a straight line method for a full years of depreciation in the first year versus a half year convention using double declining balance. Uh, but you'll see it in the second year because in the second year of depreciation, you're not going to come up with the same number under a straight line versus double declining. We'll probably see that when we get to our uh, example problems.